Hear the word of the Lord. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Welcome this morning to St. Andrew's Cathedral. We are joining together virtually, and I'm not sure where you are joining from, but we all come today as God's people with the express purpose of hearing from God as his word is read, listening to God as the word is preached, responding in song, and coming to him in dependent prayer. My name is Malcolm Gill. It's my joy to be able to join with you this morning. And as we begin, let us lift our voices through singing together the hymn, O Worship the King. Brothers and sisters, we have come together to meet with God and to take our part in the building up of his church. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Let us acknowledge our failure to serve him as he deserves and return to the Lord with repentance and faith, praying together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have good news. The Bible says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Give praise to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. We now come to a time where we are going to read God's word. And as we do, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah 1. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I read children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manager, manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to this sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on him. Why should you be beaten any more? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured and your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head there is no soundness, only wounds and bruises and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before your eyes, laid waste and when over, and and when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked you to do this, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate them with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. Let us settle this matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to, be, used to dwell in her. But now, murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself of my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove 
all impurities. I will restore your leaders as in the days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterwards, you will be called a city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tinder and his work a spark. Both will burn together and no one to quench the fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm five in our responsorial psalm. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for I pray to you. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. But I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down towards your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favour as with a shield. The second Bible reading is from the book of John, chapter 13, starting at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, let us affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe about God and his love for us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. lovely to be here. Um, Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who speaks, and we pray that you would speak to our hearts now in the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might see your Son, 
love him and serve him gladly until he comes. Amen. Uh, well, of course, we're uh, still very much in the midst of uh, responding to the uh, pandemic, and as we do so, we're conscious that we're not able to gather uh, in person, and we're conscious especially of those uh, who've lost loved ones this week in our own city, uh, and many more who are feeling anxious and uh, stressed uh, about a number of issues. The big promise of the Bible is that there is a new world coming, where there is no more sickness or decay or dying. And this is not just wishful thinking. We believe it because Jesus is raised from the dead, the first in the crop of the new world. Uh, today we're starting a uh, series of talks on the uh, massive book of the prophet Isaiah, 66 chapters long, the Old Testament book most quoted in the New Testament, apart from the Psalms. Uh, Jesus reads from Isaiah at the beginning of his ministry, uh, announcing that he has come to fulfill what Isaiah spoke of. And one of the great themes of the book of Isaiah is the coming of the new world. The book ends this way in chapter 65, verse 17 of chapter 65 of Isaiah. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. No longer will children be born to live but a few days. My servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts. The wolf and the lamb will lie down together. God has plans that encompass the whole earth. And at the beginning of the prophecy, Isaiah says, Hear me, you heavens. Give ear, you earth. The message is for Judah and Jerusalem, verse 1 says, but verse 2 summons the whole cosmos to hear, because what the Lord has to say to his people affects the whole creation. We're told that the vision is given to Isaiah in, during the reign of kings Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. So we know we're talking about uh, the last half of the 8th century before Jesus. God has big plans for renewing the world, but God works through his people in history, in all the ordinary circumstances of personal life and community life and national life. And for all the differences between ancient Israel and modern Australia, God is still working out his big plan and he is still at work in his people, people who will hear his word and live in the light of it. And God still speaks to his people through the vision given so long ago to Isaiah, but heard afresh by us today. The first chapter sets the scene for the whole book. It's grim, but not without hope. And I want to talk about the sin of God's people and the power of God's grace. Firstly, the sin of God's people. Uh, now, I suppose one of the most uh, well-known parts of the book of Isaiah is the call of the prophet, which is described in chapter 6, and which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. Uh, that is the beginning of Isaiah's ministry. So chapters 1 to 5 are out of chronological order. They contain messages which Isaiah delivered after chapter 6, but they're placed at the beginning of the book to do a couple of things. They give us, first of all, a window into the spiritual realities that lie behind the military and political situation uh, at this point in Israel's history. And they introduce some of the big themes of the book, the sovereignty of God, sin and judgment, mercy and hope and renewal. And so when we get to chapter 6 to 12, you'll notice the, the references to names and events and dates but there is less of that historical material in these opening chapters because the emphasis here is on the spiritual reality, to uh, the spiritual dimension to those realities. The biblical view of the world is that God is king and that everything that takes place in the world has a spiritual character. At the end of our lives, we'll not give an account for how many prayers we said or how many times we went to church as though God were only interested in our religious life. 
the whole of our lives will be the basis upon which he makes his assessment of us. And God as king will want to know if we worshipped him from Monday to Saturday, not just whether we went to church for an hour a week or tuned in for an hour on Sunday. He'll want to know if we worshipped him in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, at our celebrations, and in triumph and disaster, in our relationships and our activities. So chapters 1 to 5 give us a window into how God is seeing the worship of his people in everyday life, in their response to him, in their national and religious and social life. And what we see is the failure of God's people to respond to him rightly. Our attention is first drawn to how culpable Israel's sin is, how blameworthy. Uh, for a few reasons, the sin of Israel is contrary to nature. Verse 2, the Lord says, I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The grace that saved, the love that cared, Israel has rejected. An ox is more responsive and attentive to its master than Israel are to their God. Secondly, their sin is in spite of their privilege. In verse 4, Israel are described in exalted terms, a nation, a people, a brood, and children. They are privileged. What other nation uh, does God speak of in this way? But in the face of this privilege, the second half of verse 4 records their responses. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One. They have turned their backs. So instead of being a holy nation, a royal people, a loved brood, they are a sinful nation, a people burdened with guilt, a brood of evildoers and children given to corruption. And thirdly, they are blameworthy in that their sin is contrary to reason. Isaiah cries out to them in verse 5, Why should you be beaten any more? Why should you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart is afflicted. And uh, here Isaiah is referring to the political situation, um, the might of the Assyrian army, uh, the armies of King Sennacherib of Assyria are ranged against Israel in murderous hostility. And Isaiah is saying, is not even the advance of your enemies enough to make you flee back to God? This makes no sense. Here is a nation who are reared by God, recipients of His love and grace, people who are steeped in privileges from His hands, and who even have the benefit of His correction and discipline, yet who rebel against Him, who treat Him worse than an ox treats His master. So Isaiah begins by establishing the blameworthiness of Israel's sin. It is contrary to nature, it is contrary to privilege, it is contrary to reason. And then he paints the way in which this is expressed. And he begins with their religious life and three ways in which their religious life is compromised by sin. Firstly, it is merely formal self-serving habit. Verse 11, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and goats. Stop bringing your meaningless offerings. Well, it's very strong language, isn't it? And of course, this whole system of the temple worship and, and the sacrificial system was instituted by God, but how can it be that he's so strongly against it? It's because God is opposed to hollow worship, worship that is merely the repetition of religious habits, especially God is against self-serving and self-centered worship. 
Notice in verses 13 and 14, your incense is detestable to me. I cannot bear your evil assemblies, your new moon festivals. God distances himself from their religious practices. They are an abuse. They are not his feasts. God is against hollow, self-serving religion. And even in the midst of a pandemic, and perhaps especially in the midst of a pandemic, we need to remind ourselves as we tune in to these online services, as we are not able to meet in person and serve one another in listening and prayer and mutual encouragement, as we are not able to encourage one another by joining together in song. We need to ensure that we are, as we tune in online, that we are opening ourselves to God's Word, to God's way, making ourselves available to Him and aligning ourselves with God's purposes in the world and His purposes in our own lives. God is against hollow, self-serving religion. The second failing in their religious life is that it is divorced from their ethical life. What they do in the temple has no impact on what they do in the marketplace. Verse 15, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen to you. Your hands are full of blood. The Jewish posture of prayer was standing up with outstretched hands, and to be in the temple in prayer was literally to have your hands full of the Lord, to be totally preoccupied with the Lord. But the Lord says, those who stand and pray have hands full of blood, the blood of guilt. So the Lord says He will hide His eyes from them rather than making His face to shine upon them in the words of the priestly blessing. In order for their prayers to be heard, what must they do? Verse 16, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right. Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless. They must get right with God wash and take your deeds away, and they must allow the worship of God to transform their ethics, their behaviour. Personally, they are to stop doing wrong and learn what is right. They must learn a new priority, not seeking the interests of self, but of justice. They must assist those who are oppressed and speak for the weak, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. There is the personal and the social sphere on view, personal and individual morality, compassion towards others, advocacy and reform in society. God is king of everything, and worship is the whole of our response to God. The prayers of the Israelites are like clanging gongs in God's ears, because their hands were full of their own self-centeredness, evil and injustice. And their worship has a third failing exposed in verse 29. You will be ashamed of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. And although this is uh, very uh, picturesque language, um, Isaiah here is uncovering uh, that their religion is a mask for a secret love affair with false gods. Though they are busy in the temple, the thing they have chosen and delight in are the nature and fertility cults of the pagans, but these are a garden without water a fading tree. Anything that you put in place of God as the focus of worship, devotion and delight is without the ability to sustain us or to satisfy us or to nourish us. 
If we worship our possessions, we find they break down and become obsolete and pass out of fashion. If we worship our children, we find that they have their own lives to lead. If we worship our youthfulness, we find that we age. If we worship our career, we find that one day we retire. If we worship good times, we find that we tire of them. If we worship experience, we find that we are always one step away from satisfaction. If we worship marriage, we find that no other person can make us complete. If we worship freedom, we find that we are caged by our own secret fears and anxieties. When we fail to worship God, we find that the world is a garden without water. And verse 31 warns us of the inevitable self-destructiveness of false worship. It's not God, but ourselves who are made small. Verse 31, the mighty man will become tender and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. Israel's sin was blameworthy, expressed in its religious and social life. It's a bleak picture. But we turn to the Lord's response. Uh, So the power of God's grace. Secondly, the power of God's grace. Unsurprisingly, we hear that the Lord will punish his people for their wickedness. They may oppress the weak. They may pursue their own interests through corrupt means, but God will defend the fatherless and will not turn a blind eye to corruption. So throughout the passage, we hear the announcement of God's judgment. And yet, more surprising, there is a strong and clear and unmistakable note of hope in the midst of judgment, of forgiveness in the midst of punishment, of restoration in the midst of destruction, of grace in the midst of justice. Verse 9 speaks of survivors. The city will be judged, we're told, like Sodom and Gomorrah, but some will survive. The city is described in verse 21 as a prostitute, a faithless city, but in verse 27 there is a promise that Jerusalem will be a city of justice and righteousness. The Lord has left survivors. And then look at verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land, but if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These are promises of restoration, of cleansing and forgiveness. The Lord has spoken of how his people must change their behaviour, but they cannot undo the evil they have done. Living rightly today does not win forgiveness of evil done yesterday. They must come, according to verse 18, and they must wash, according to verse 16. Forgiveness depends on God's initiative, to wash and cleanse them, to have them come to him, to make their crimson-red sin white as wool. Here is mercy unexpected, undeserved, unconditional. Come, wash. There is no possibility of being not guilty There is no possibility of erasing past wrongs by turning a new leaf. If the invitation to come is resisted, if the command to wash is refused, then death will follow because justice demands it. But there is a way of grace. There is a door of mercy. There is the word of the Lord from the mouth of the Lord. Come, wash. I don't know what the Lord knows about you, and you don't know what he knows about me. 
but you should know that your scarlet sins may be washed away if you will come to the Lord and be washed. On the night of his arrest, ar arrest, Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And Peter responded then, don't only wash my feet, wash my whole body. Our sins deserve the punishment of God, but God says to us, come and wash. And as we read this chapter, we can't help but feel the tension between judgment and grace. If some are spared, why not all? If sin is to be punished, how can some be forgiven? How will this tension between divine punishment and divine forgiveness be resolved? And we're not told. But for us, hundreds and hundreds of years after Isaiah, we see the tension between judgment and grace more resolved than Isaiah ever did because we see the man upon the cross, the man in whom God's judgment on sin and his grace towards sinners meets in perfect resolution. If you don't understand how that could be, then you don't understand what it means to be a Christian. Please contact us. Get in touch with a Christian friend or with the cathedral so we can help you understand that. On the other hand, if you think you do understand it, you have more to learn because it's inexhaustible and that's the way it should be. Our response to God is to be assessed in terms of of the whole of our lives. We need to see how blameworthy our sin is. Since we know the grace of God, since we are steeped in privileges, how can we turn our backs on Him? We need to check the character of our response. Is it just hollow habit? Does it mask a secret delight and preference for some God substitute, which is just a garden without water? Are we ourselves transformed ethically in our relationships with others, in our contribution to the character of our society? And once we've checked, we need to see the wonder and the beauty of God's response to our failings. We need to see the judgment and mercy of the Lord Almighty in the cross of Christ and return there to its foot in repentance and faith, turning from our sin and offering our whole selves to Jesus, who makes our scarlet sins white as snow. Amen.
Would you join with me as we pray to our Heavenly Father? Gracious God, in this time of distancing and isolation, we praise you that you are so close to us and you have promised never to leave us. As King David prays in the Psalms, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Please let this truth be our comfort in those times when we feel the distance between ourselves and our friends and family, when we miss meeting with our brothers and sisters in our church communities, when we long for more social interactions. Thank you for your spirit who dwells in every believer and who binds us together by whom we have rich fellowship with one another. Father, we pray for all people across your world as you take us through this season of uncertainty and challenge, of confusion and despair. In particular, Lord, we bring before you the nation of Indonesia as COVID-19 continues to cause devastating loss of life. We pray for those who are sick and for their families. And we pray for those here in Sydney who are unable to be there with their relatives, who can only watch from afar as the virus devastates that nation. Lord God, we ask that you would have mercy on this place. As the virus threatens to spread into rural areas, we ask you to slow the spread in these places where there is little health care available. And we continue to ask you to be guiding the decisions and actions of all our leaders across your world. Please help them to heed the right advice and to do everything within the authority you have given them to serve and protect the people they are responsible for. Please also inspire generosity between the nations. Let us be quick to share whatever resources you have given us for the good of your world. Father, as families lose their normal routines, please strengthen them in love and patience. Please give great wisdom to parents as they juggle many things and try to provide a safe and happy home. And at this time, we particularly pray for Year 12 students as they head into the HSC with the ongoing disruption to their education. Father, we pray that parents and teachers would support them with kindness and encouragement. We pray for good decisions to be made by education departments that reassure students that they can still look forward to pursuing further education and training. And we pray for our Christian families that good conversations and times of prayer would bring relief from anxiety, would remind us of our identity in Christ and the plans and purposes that he has laid for all of us before the creation of the world. And for those who live alone, please surround them with such a strong sense of your presence at this time. And please provide opportunities to maintain and enjoy friendships. Please protect us all from finding unhelpful and unhealthy ways of managing stress or boredom, anxiety and isolation. As a church, would we all be seeking ways to love and support our Christian brothers and sisters? Give us compassionate hearts and sensitivity to know who we can call, who we can pray for, and who we can pray with. We pray in particular for members of this church who are dealing with sickness and with the loss of loved ones. Be their comfort, we ask. May none of our community feel neglected during this time. Rather, would this body be growing together in love and compassion with Christ as our head. And in his name, we ask all of these things. Amen. Let us continue in prayer as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen and a prayer of the day for the 10th Sunday after Trinity. Let your merciful ears, Lord God, be open to the prayers of your people, and so that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as will please you through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, we've come towards the end of our service, and at this time, I'm going to invite our Archbishop, Kanishka Raphael, to make an important announcement for our Cathedral family. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, well, I'm really delighted uh, to let you know this morning that during the week, the chapter confirmed my nomination of Canon Sandy Grant uh, to be the next Dean of Sydney and of this cathedral. Um, Sandy has been Senior Canon of St Michael's Cathedral Wollongong uh, since 2004. He's known um, uh, and loved by his congregation and known in the Wollongong uh, area, especially for his uh, evangelistic heart, uh, for his uh, careful and applied preaching, um, for uh, uh, his wise and attentive pastoral care. Uh, in the life of our diocese, Sandy has uh, been a member, is a member of Standing Committee and he's been involved in a, in a number of significant ways over the years, including in the areas of Indigenous ministry, in representation to government about uh, gambling and such things as that. Uh, and uh, over the last five or six years, he's been co-chair with Archdeacon Cara Hartley of our work group uh, responding to domestic violence. Um, Sandy is a godly and faithful pastor. He's a diligent evangelist. Uh, he's a fine teacher of the Word of God um, and a gracious and compassionate voice in the public square. And most of all, he's a devoted uh, and humble servant of the Lord and his people. Um, <clears throat> Sandy and his wife Karen are uh, well loved uh, in their congregation in Wollongong. Please pray for them. Uh, who are receiving this news today as well. Uh, uh, they've had, uh, Sandy and Karen, have had a very fruitful uh, ministry um, at St Michael's over the last 17 years, but I'm so delighted that they have uh, felt led by the Lord to accept the invitation to minister here in the city. And Sandy has prepared a short video to introduce himself to you. Greetings to you from wherever you're watching the service online today. My name is Sandy Grant and this is Karen. Apart from being a wonderful wife and mum, Karen's a music teacher, band tutor and keen scripture teacher. We have three adult daughters, Laura, Hannah and Rachel, who all follow the Lord and live in Sydney. And we have three-year-old Grudel, Maisie. It's been my honour to serve St Michael's Cathedral Wollongong as senior minister for almost 17 years. It's now humbling to have the confidence of Archbishop Karnishka and the Cathedral Chapter to serve the people of St Andrews in the heart of Sydney. My motivation is the same as before I entered Moore College over 30 years ago. It's the cross of Christ. I love the logic of C.T. Studd, who gave up his English test cricket career to be a missionary on three different continents. He said, if Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice I could make in response could ever be too great. So I want to serve the risen Lord Jesus the best I can. I look forward to joining your church family and staff team in a ministry of word and prayer and love. As Psalm 119 says, the unfolding of your words gives light. Karen and I won't be the first in our family to attend St Andrews since one of our girls was a member of the evening congregation for a couple of years. And so that helps us appreciate St Andrews as a local church, as well as for its gospel voice to the city and world. In terms of timeline, we expect to finish here early in November and Lord willing, after four weeks annual leave, to start early in December. The task is both daunting and exciting, alongside all the feelings of leaving people we've loved and served here for so long. But Psalm 147, verses 10 and 11, are my strength. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of a warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. The Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, we've come to the end of our service and we've been reminded through the prophet Isaiah today of the wonderful truths that are true in the gospel. When we fail to worship God, we are like a garden without water. Yet in spite of our rebellion, 
our wonderful God invites us, come wash, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be washed whiter than snow. We've been reminded of the grace, the forgiveness and restoration that are ours in Christ Jesus. And with that in mind, let us sing our concluding hymn together, The God of Abram Praise. Brothers and sisters, just a reminder that in just a few moments, you are invited to join with us via Zoom to have a time of fellowship and prayer. Details can be found on the website at www.sydneycathedral.com. But let us send each other out with this prayer of dedication. Lord God, we rejoice in your greatness and power, your patience and love, your mercy and justice. Enable us by your spirit to honour you in our thoughts, words and actions and to serve you in every aspect of our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>